Tales by G.M. Danielson. Dominicane by Aaron Fleck. The tall man lay dying, thought of as beautiful during his youth and terrible at the height of his power. He now lay wrapped in costly linens on a massive carved bed, as if ready for burial. His large hands, skeletal from the sickness, yet strong and fierce, grip the dampened bedclothes like the talons of a wounded eagle falling from its high-flown perch. The fever, the harbinger of death, has ravaged his body for days and will claim him before another fortnight has passed. Heavy velvet draperies are drawn tight against a bustling newborn world that swarms outside the dying man's walls. The blood upon his lips blood which stains his clothing and his flesh and betrays the nature of his sickness as if it had betrayed the lives of prince and beggar and priest without remorse lays unwashed for all to see. The man's fever crests and breaks then claims him again drawing him deep into the cloying embrace of the last abyss yet unfathomed in his soul. In his sleep he cries out the name of a man draped in scarlet splendor, the Cardinal, who is his own son, and who will one day be Pope. The son has journeyed far from Rome to serve upon his father the last holy rite that Christendom confers upon the living. The Cardinal has now departed, returning to Rome. The room is dark, empty, still as a waiting tomb. The dying man slowly opens his eyes. His breath is shallow and he coughs. The blood comes again and then he is silent. The furtive, hurried rustle of sweeping garments catches his attention. His eyes sift the gloaming darkness of the chamber but no one is there. A weak sigh escapes his lips. He hears a soft murmur. An old woman sits unmoving in a chair beside the waning fire, her head obscured behind a fringed shawl. Suddenly she turns her head, and he sees her eyes are wild with horror. She opens her mouth to scream, but only silence emerges from the dark pit of her throat. Then a tiny man in lace and green velvet crawls out from between her parted lips. The hideous imp gazes about, then yawns and lazily scratches his crotch. The dying man sees that the mouth of the creature is the beak of an egret, but contains many rows of sharp razor-like teeth. Lorenzo almost faints from loss of reaction, but his eyes remain open, locked upon the grotesque spectacle. The old woman falls to the floor. Her dried flesh is nothing more than a discarded, empty husk, as thin and yellowed as parchment, and split open like old leather in many places. The sick man wretches violently with revulsion. He cries out, but no one hears. Another sound roars within his ears. He is overwhelmed by a suffocating odor and a red vision all at once, as if the whole of Florence was engulfed in a blazing funeral pyre. But then he remembers. He is not in Florence. He is at Carreggi. The dying man begs for release to claim him, but death abandons him to tremble at the shore of a monstrous gaping abyss. 
As the fevered tide recedes, the tortured throes weaken their hold on Lorenzo's body. He raises himself up and gazes straight into the black, unblinking eyes of a gigantic yellow pig perched on the end of his bed. The pig offers its hideous nakedness from beneath the soiled habit of a cloistered nun. The veil of purity rests askew atop its grizzled head as bloated lips curl in a parody of prayer and lust and unclean hooves finger the beads of a rosary. A renewed paroxysm grips the body of the Prince of the Medici as spectral fingers of soulless depravity march in unhallowed silence from the shadows of the darkened chamber. Glittering beetles with the wings of red bats and ram's horns fornicate wantonly with the corpulent virgins clothed only in the virtue of their failed modesty. Rabid dogs prance about proudly on malformed hind legs, sporting the withered arms and heads of old toothless men who offer all manner of unnatural and fantastic creatures for him to behold. Serpents with the heads of women and crowned with wolf's ears curl and twine sinuously about the cold stone floor, then disappear under the bed. Countless unseemingly wonders cavort about obscenely before him, displaying hideous malignant trophies and their own brutal mutilations with equal delight. Lorenzo dares not close his eyes for even an instant. A tarnished golden harp with broken strings mates with a crushed mandolin, birthing blood-stained monsters which rape his sobbing, reddened ears with their haunted, infernal melodies. He is a good man, a prince among new nobility. He will attain the most precious jewel imaginable, immortality of name. But he does not know this, and he will never taste the future he has helped to secure for his heirs, in both name and spirit. So he weeps, as his claw-like hands grasp the filthy, dampened linens of his deathbed. After a time, he surrenders to something of a dreamless peace. The next morning, a serving woman comes to Lorenzo's rooms and throws wide the heavy draperies to the blinking daylight sun. The cheerful golden rays stab torturously upon his tear-stained eyes. The coughing begins again, and the woman stands at his bedside, gently wiping away the blood, old and newly flowed. She caresses his forehead with a cool, damp cloth and smiles sadly upon his face. The man sighs, too exhausted to speak, unable to even thank the woman for her gentle kindness. A fading dream licks hungrily at the still, dark corners of his memory. Nothing but a dream of the night before. There are no monsters in the man's heart, no horrors to chase away the bright sunlight which shines upon his palace. No night beasts at large to haunt the rational world of men. The woman departs the chamber, and a dark shape silently enters Lorenzo's presence and closes the great carved door behind him so that they may be alone. Lorenzo knows this man, he has paid many visits to these darkened chambers over the last days of this illustrious life. Dominicane. Ah, yes. The Dominican. The horrific spectres of the fevered nighttime dream have fled the day, but this man who stands before him, the greatest of all nightmares he will ever know, will not leave. And while the son of Lorenzo de' Medici has journeyed far from Rome, draped in scarlet splendor to sanctify his father's soul and wish him Godspeed to heaven, this man 
This Dominican in filthy tattered robes has come to tear his soul from his breast and cast him into hell. In 1492, Lorenzo de' Medici, called the Magnificent by history, lay dying in the Villa Carreghi in the Tuscan hills outside his beloved Florence. It is both widely rumored and equally denied that the nefarious prelate Savonarola paid Lorenzo a visit during which he damned his soul to an unrelenting eternity in hell. This is an imagined vision of what such a meeting might have meant to a man in the delirium of his deathbed and illustrated via the infernal terrains of their contemporary, the brilliant but troubled Dutch painter Hieronymus Bosch. <laughs> 